So chapter 10 talks about reproduction and mating in insects, and we'll talk specifically about aquatic insects. And first of all, um, it's difficult to separate our study of insect reproduction from our human biases, but we're going to try. Um, sex and sexuality in humans is very complex, and that's actually true for all other organisms too. In this chapter, we will refer to organisms that produce eggs as females and organisms that produce sperm as males. But that distinction does not work well in humans, and many humans are born as intersex individuals and can't be classified in either, um, in either sex. So in terms of insect reproduction, there's a life cycle showing female laying eggs that have been fertilized, eggs hatching into nymphs, nymphs turning into, in this case for a mayfly, a sub-imago, um, and then the sub-imago transforms into an imago after about 24 hours, and that um, imago is then able to mate and reproduce and lay eggs if it's a female and produce sperm if it's a male. So reproduction requires the production of gametes, either eggs or sperm. Females are fertilized internally, um, and they can some some species can store sperm to fertilize their legs later at, in the future. The first step in reproduction is finding a mate, and um, organisms that reproduce once per lifetime are called semelparous, and organisms that can reproduce many times per lifetime are called heteroparous. And so um, some long-lived adults, particularly beetles and true bugs, are heteroparous. Reproductive events often take place in the terrestrial landscape instead of the aquatic landscape. And um, basically, it goes oviposition, which is laying eggs, to embryogenesis, which is the development of the embryo, to the first instar, which is the organism that hatches. And usually that first instar is hatched in the aquatic environment. Female internal organs are made up of a pair of ovaries that release oocytes or eggs. Um, then the eggs are carried through um, calyces and oviducts into a genital chamber. The genital chamber is where um, the spermatophore, which is sperm plus um, sometimes a whole complicated set of things um, are deposited into the genital chamber. And um, the spermatheca is a sperm storage organ. So some um, insects can store sperm for future um, fertilization. Mayflies can't do this, but a lot of the other aquatic organisms can. Ovaries are built of several ovarioles that have long terminal filaments. And um, there are sometimes also accessory glands in the female um, reproductive organ kind of complex. And those accessory glands can do things like provide protective coatings to, to eggs or add adhesives that can help stick eggs to surfaces. So the ovarioles consist of this terminal filament, which is a long um, stalk. Then there is a germarium a vitellarium and a pedicel, which is the ovarial stalk. The terminal filaments may be fused together and then they can anchor the ovaries to the body wall. The germarium, um, in the germarium, mitosis of germ cells gives rise to oogonia, the primary oocytes, and nutritive cells in some ovarioles. When the oocytes enter the vitellarium, um, which comes after the germarium. They're then encased in a one cell thick layer of follicular epilithium. And mature eggs are held in the oviducts prior to fertilization and oviposition. So the eggs of aquatic insects are really varied. Um, they can be all kinds of different shapes. A lot of these pictures from 1895 are terrestrial insects, but number 10, is a water scorpion egg, which I just thought was really cool. So each egg is a single cell. It's a gamete and it's haploid. Um, the outermost layer is called the chorion or the shell. 
underneath the chorion, there is a vitelline envelope. And then inside the egg, it's mostly yolk. So um, there's a little thin band of cytoplasm, sometimes called periplasm, just inside the vitelline envelope. Um, but the, the eggs provide a lot of yolk to the developing young. Oops, I don't have um, my, um, what's it called? My animations on this one, sorry about that. So vitelogenesis and choreogenesis. Um, like I said, there's an enormous amount of yolk produced inside the egg, um, and this is produced by vitelogenesis. Most insect eggs are large relative to the size of the adult, so um, the egg provides a lot of support to the growing embryo. The yolk contains proteins and nucleic acids, lipids, and carbohydrates, but unfortunately because um, there's so much of it and it's such kind of like rich fatty material, toxins that are fat stored can also be transferred from the mother to offspring through the yolk. And then sometimes there are waxy layers that are secreted to coat the outside of the egg, but that's mainly to protect them from drying out. Um, and so that's more important for terrestrial eggs than for aquatic eggs. So the function of the chorion, um, is the outside. It's often sculptured with grooves and ridges. Um, it needs to allow little gaps and holes for sperm entry, things called micropiles, but it also needs to have some elasticity because it needs to be squeezed out of the insect when it's laid. It also needs to expand as the embryo is growing, um, and it needs to protect the egg from environmental stressors, from predators, um, while at the same time allowing gas exchange. So it's a really complicated um, structure. Here are some pictures of the chorion for aquatic moth eggs. Some really crazy patterns and really interesting features. These are scanning electron micrographs. Um, okay, male reproductive organs. Male reproductive organs store, produce, produce store, and deliver sperm. Um, Sometimes the sperm is delivered with benefits, these spermatophores, which I'll talk about in a little bit, but basically they provide extra nutrients um, and nutrition to the female. So in male um, insects, there are paired testes, there are paired vas deferens, um, and then seminal vesicles that connect in an ejaculatory duct. Um, there are also accessory glands that can help to build the spermatophore. And um, sperm development starts with the germarium and spermatogonia are produced from germ cells. Then they divide and transform into spermatocytes. Um, mayflies, so this is interesting because most, organ, most male re reproductive organs like female organs, um, there's the two, the two kind of um, seminal vesicles and they come together to make one, um, one reproductive organ, but in mayflies, both in males and females, like the ovaries develop eggs through two separate tubes, and in mayfly males, the sperm is developed through two separate um, peens. So here we have male mayflies, they have a separate peen per testy. The spermatophore, what am I talking about? So um, some insects package up the sperm in this kind of um, nutritious kind of jelly mass, basically. Um, the structures of the spermatophore vary enormously. Um, the spermatophore and the sperm are transferred to the female during copulation. And then basically some, some parts of the spermatophore can, they can serve certain functions. So if they, the hormones in the spermatophore can induce the female to produce more eggs they can alter her behaviors, um, and they're often kind of thought of as a nuptial gift of proteins and lipids. So often the female will eat the spermatophore. Um, it's kind of like this additional benefit of mating with a male. Other nuptial gifts are things like some males will provide a prey item during copulation, like this fly in the top left corner. Um, and then you can see other shapes of different spermatophores in the picture. Okay, so here's a few different 
pictures of life cycles. We have the a metabolist life cycle where basically an egg turns into a larva and then the larva basically just turn into a mature larva as an adult. We have a hemimetabolist life cycle where the egg um, turns into a larva and then there's, um, there's a transformation between the, the final instar and the adult where we have a holometabolist life cycle. Egg to larva, the larvas get larger and there's a pupation phase, and then there's an adult. So three different types of insect life cycles, but all starting with an egg. Um, the number of eggs in a female is sometimes a measure of potential fecundity. It doesn't mean that she's going to lay them all, so that's why it's potential fecundity. And the timing um, of sexual maturation can be influenced by the temperature, by photo period, and by humidity. Maturation can also be influenced by energy stores and feeding. So um, malnourishment can slow down sexual uh, maturity. Some adults need blood meals for egg production. We talked about this with both black flies and mosquitoes. Um, and there's often a trade-off between um, using really expensive flight muscles and reproducing. So it's called the oogenesis flight syndrome. It basically means that you have to, as a female, you have to weigh the costs of flying and laying your eggs because doing both is too energy intensive. Here's some eggs. Um, these are chironomid eggs um, stuck to a rock in kind of a mass of jelly. So each one is a separate oviposition event. And these are water penny eggs. Um, again, kind of often laid in clumps um, to, I think, for protection, right? Then there's aggregation and mating. So the first issue can be finding a mate. And what's crazy is sometimes the emergence of adults, especially in parts of the Midwest, can just be these massive events. So these really dense swarms of mayflies, sometimes damselflies and dragonflies can be, um, can be sensed on Doppler radar. So these are massive swarms um, covering multiple counties huge amounts of biomass, as you can see by the photos. A lot of the swarms are males predominantly, um, kind of looking for females, but sometimes um, there are females in the swarm. The other thing is that um, different populations that are genetically distinct tend to swarm in different um, locations. So finding a mate, um, Organisms can use vision to recognize conspecifics and colors can sometimes denote maturity. Vibrations can signal readiness, such as drumming on riparian vegetation or ripples on the water surface. Sounds either underwater or in the, way, in the air. So stridulation, which is like kind of rubbing one structure against another one with ridges. Um, some insects can actually sing songs or they can make um, different sounds through wing beats. And then there's chemical communication through pheromones, which typically happens in the air. Um, copulation. So um, I'm going to show some pictures, mainly of damselflies, because they're so interesting. Um, damselflies, their main genitalia don't even come into contact. So the male is grasping the female behind the head and um, the prior to grabbing her is transferred sperm um, from his end to a sperm reservoir under his abdomen. And then the female bends her tail underneath to gather the sperm from this accessory um, genitalia. So this is called the wheel position for odonates. And um, here's a Valentine's picture for you. It's a nice little heart shape. Um, some interesting things, some sneaky things that um, can happen. Male odonates can actually remove the sperm that's been deposited by previous males. But at the same time, females can then choose which sperm to use for fertilization so they can kind of compartmentalize it. Uh, males of a lot of different species will guard their mates, spending several minutes to several days um, mate guarding. Some species can use a plug um, to kind of plug up um, the female so that she can't mate with subsequent males. And then males of especially Heteroptera 
can ride on the backs of females for up to a week. And the females, um, in kind of like a reverse spermatophore kind of situation, will give a nuptial gift of a waxy secretion to keep the, the male fed while he's riding along. And then lastly, we'll talk about parthenogenesis. So basically, everything to this point has been sexual reproduction, um, but there are lots of aquatic organisms that just reproduce through parthenogenesis, or they facultatively reproduce through parthenogenesis when um, sexual selection is too costly or there aren't enough mates available. So what this means is that females can produce unfertilized eggs that produce viable offspring. And the, the eggs that are produced can be only female, thalitoki, they can be only male, arenatoki, or they can be a mix, which is, there's two terms for that, amphitoki and deuterotoki. So because of the, the ability to produce eggs of different sexes, sex ratios may end up being skewed um, different from one-to-one -one ratios um, because of parthenogenesis. And just, um, you know, like in lots of different species of like birds and lizards, the chromosomes, the sex chromosomes are not as simple as the, the X, 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 Y that we think of in, in humans, which is also not that simple. There's a lot of other uh, sex chromosome combinations in humans um, that represent different scenarios, um, but there's all kinds of complications in terms of sex chromosomes in insects as well. So it's not, it's not as cut and dry as we've been made to believe. All right, that's the end.